Hi, welcome to Tamu Awani. I'm Kamaru Bahrain and thanks to the Bridges, uh, the Dialogue Towards a Culture of Peace by the International Peace Foundation, we have here today with me the Reverend uh, Jesse Jackson. Thank you. Welcome to Malaysia. The first you, visit you, and my first interview with you. Um, before that, I'd like to give a bit of background. You know, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson has been a name that we, even we in Malaysia, have heard of. Uh, human rights activist and fighter and uh, also running for the presidential campaign in the 1980s and uh, however the image that I cannot forget is when I saw the live transmission of the announcement of Obama being president and there you were with tears streaming down your cheek and uh, what, what's well, your comment on that? It was a magical moment it was an historical moment in our history because President Barack Obama is not the cause of, he's a result of many years of struggle mm -hmm. and martyrs and marchers and some of those who made that night, the climactic night possible, were, were killed. Mm -hmm. They were murdered. Uh, they died. They couldn't be there. I wish they could have been there for the big yeah. moment. It's mm -hmm. like he ran a 60-year a marathon race. He ran the last lap. Okay. A 60 year race. Yeah. I mean, coming out of World War II, mm -hmm. the African American soldiers de determined they were going to fight Nazism abroad and racism at home. Mm -hmm. They came back home fighting. Mm -hmm. The 54 Supreme Court decision to rule apartheid mm -hmm. illegal in the U.S., it was yes. legal up to that time. Mm -hmm. We won that great legal, significant battle. Yeah. Dr. King emerged in 1955 mm -hmm. uh, using mass action, mass protests. Mm -hmm. And it goes on to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And as we sought the right to vote, Meg Edwards was killed. It's one of the government training. Two Jews and a black were killed. Viola Lewis was killed. Many young people murdered and martyred in that process. But in the process, we inspired people around the world. In South Africa, they were singing, We Shall Overcome, mm -hmm. you know, in Shopsville. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the soldier facing a tank in China uh, as we fought to def redefine dignity for the world. They were saying in the uh, regional overcoming the dance Poland. And so all of these movements, all these people, those works and those actions made that night possible. So it was both the joy of that moment of victory, mm -hmm. but also I reflect upon the journey that got us there. It's, just, it's also been said that it has not been an easy campaign for Obama. The white accused him of being too black. The black accused him of being a bit white. So how, how, how do you see that? Because it's easy to represent minorities sometimes, but to push yourself as a centrist force that appeals to everybody at the same time fighting for causes that you've been aligned to. The blessings that he has, you know, I haven't spent a lot of his formative years in Indonesia. Uh, going with classmates who were uh, Christian and Muslim and, and Hindu, mm -hmm. uh, having spent time in, in Hawaii, he grew up in a different setting, and then to Columbia, and then to Harvard. And so, in some sense, an African father, a white female mother from America. Yeah. That, this, in some sense, the coalition is embodied in his very being, mm -hmm. his own life experiences. And what he did was to find common ground, which we worked for for a long time. In other words, black America didn't change so much as white America changed. Mm -hmm. The same whites who once denied us the right to vote were voting for us. Mm -hmm. The same whites who once would not allow blacks to use or public facilities accept that. And so we're now learning to live together and vote together. So many years we work, people like Dr. King and others, tearing down walls. As the walls are basically to come down, he's able to build a bridge. So whether you're white, black, or brown, there are certain common ground issues that allows us to, to unite. So, for example, the, you know, we fight to overcome the impact of infant mortality mm -hmm. and short life expectancy among the poor, the impact of plants closing, jobs leaving, drugs and guns coming, the impact of, our, of the corruption in high places of our banks collapse requires this huge stimulus. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff there that we have in common. And so at the right moment in time, he tapped into that need for common ground. I might say that the athletic events, you know, the soccer, yeah. football, mm -hmm. uh, baseball, uh, basketball, with, with thousands of people, millions, choosing skin, using, using uniform color for skin color, yeah. learning to live together, 
this, is, this was not always possible in America. It's possible now, and I think that he, he sees that moment, and America was kind of ready for the change that he represented and tired of what we'd had before. Time to go for a short commercial break, but once we come back, more from Reverend Jesse Jackson. Thank you for still watching Tamu Awani and I'm here with my guest, Reverend Jesse Jackson. Is it also a generational thing? You know, some things a uh, nation has got to learn and it's got to go through the pain of nation building. And, and you know, after hundreds of years, now is the right time. But uh, two decades back, in the in 1980s, you tried two times, 84 and 88, but there wasn't a breakthrough then. But that's a breakthrough now. But, but I, I do not see that so much as generational as I see as, as intergenerational. Yes. These events led to this moment. Mm -hmm. For example, in 1964, uh, a black delegation from Mississippi tried to sit in uh, at, at the delegation at the, from Mississippi mm -hmm. at the uh, Democratic Convention. They would not let blacks share seats in, in Atlantic City in 1964. Mm -hmm. Finally, two got a seat, but that was just 64. 65, we finally got the right to vote. Mm -hmm. But not just blacks, white women got a chance to serve on juries. Uh, but then 18 year olds got the right to vote. And then multilingual voting. And what we were able to do in our 8 or 48 campaigns, we get something called proportionality. <clears throat> As opposed to winner take all, the majority always takes everything. Mm -hmm. We said proportionality that we would share, we lowered the threshold to become a delegate. And, we, and you got vote proportion to the number of delegates that you had. Mm -hmm. If you'd had the old rules, one to take all, if Hillary, ran, Hillary Clinton wins California, Texas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, she's the winner, yeah. uh, she would have taken all. Yeah. But on the proportionality, she could only get what she got, but not all of it. It allowed him to keep growing. Even as he was losing, he was winning, mm -hmm. building up delegates around the country. The momentum so was there. Yeah. The momentum was that. So you have the, the combination of this... Uh, very able, charismatic, young, visionary leader mm -hmm. who somehow captured the attention of the hearts of America and the world. And so in that moment in time, he emerged the victor. And I think in part because as Hillary talked about experience, looking back, he talked about change forward, looking forward. forward. Yeah. And in a real sense, you could, it's hard to go forward looking backwards. Mm -hmm. In the end, you must choose uh, hope for the future uh, over the history of the past. Mm -hmm. While the history informs the future, you cannot let the, the future, the, the past become a prison. Mm -hmm. uh, you must go forward by your hopes and not backwards by your fears. Mm -hmm. He tapped into all those emotions and uh, with a certain readiness in America, uh, inspired black population, inspired Latino population, a progressive white population coming alive. Also, Americans were tired, felt deceived by the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, we were misled into that war. Mm -hmm. we, we lost lives and money and honor for no good reason. We engaged in a preemptive strike in Iraq. Mm -hmm. We violated international law, human rights, mm -hmm. self-determination. Uh, and so that sense of deception was harmful to President Bush. And the, the slow response to the Katrina crisis mm -hmm. when the levees broke mm -hmm. in New Orleans yeah. And so as these crises set in, he emerged uh, representing a new a hope, a new way, and people became uh, and are very inspired by his leadership. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not been smooth sailing in terms of uh, how the media portray your relationship with uh, President Obama before. You know, that's the Fox News interview and all that. How, how did you rise above that? Well, because in the course of, of combat, mm -hmm. you have give and take. But we made decisions early on. I just put Barack Obama as state senator mm -hmm. uh, when hardly anyone knew him as U.S. senator and as president. And even now, we will, we will reserve the right to agree, to agree or disagree, mm -hmm. but clearly he was the best choice for the country. Mm -hmm. And represents uh, the thrust. Uh, I feel if embraced will make us, will make us better. His, mm -hmm. his stand against torture, his attempt to end the war in, in Iraq, his 
making connections, reaching out to Cuba and opening up to Venezuela. I mean, these are moves that uh, represent uh, America realizing its destiny as a healer mm -hmm. and as a bridge mm -hmm. builder. You're quite close to his family too. Jesse Jackson Jr. is friends with President Obama and uh, Michelle is also a family friend. What is it about Chicago and the grassroots human rights development there that has produced standing individuals such as yourself and Well, the down to the uh, Chicago is the kind of dumping ground for the, the Mississippi Memphis crowd coming north in, in the Great Migration. Uh, it was the place where John Johnson formed Johnson Publishing Company, Ebon and Jet Magazines. He came from a plantation in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. The place where the great Joe Lewis made it his home. And it was a place where the, the great artists, the, the Count Basie, and, uh, and these artists you know, found the place in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So in terms of black populations, there's Nigeria, Brazil, New York, and Chicago. So it's a huge population mm -hmm. of very talented people. And over the years, our politics have matured. There are three African-American congressmen in Chicago. Mm -hmm. There's one Latino congressman in, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. That coalition elected Harold Washington mayor in 1983 and 1987. Mm -hmm. And we relate to whites in a very progressive way politically. So Chicago is a kind of a, a fertile ground mm -hmm. for progressive uh, politics and challenging politics. The greater the potential, sometimes the greater the risk. And All the time. Jesse Jackson Jr. is, you know, you know uh, the allegations, Blago Javish and all that. How, how do you see that? Because this is politics. It's nothing but, that's right, that's all it is. It's yeah. nothing but an allegation, and really it's not a charge. And he will survive that. Mm -hmm. um, we've come to a very ugly period mm -hmm. in, our, in our politics, mm -hmm. but it has not stopped our, our forward progress. Mm -hmm. Right now we are preoccupied, mm -hmm. frankly, with some kind of economic stimulus to stop the uh, erosion of our economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, banks are closing and schools are closing. Uh, unemployment is rising. There's midday in our politics. Mm -hmm. It's high noon, excitement, yeah. but midnight in our economy. Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced that those issues outdistance in the lesser issue. Mm -hmm. I would like to borrow your deep experience now. I would like to go back to the 1960s. It was a dark period in Malaysia too. 1969, we had our first ever racial riots right here in, in Kuala Lumpur and uh, certain parts of Malaysia. But uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Luther King, losing him. Do you think that at that particular time, that was a great setback for the civil rights movement? Back well, then? it was a setback, but also a source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. He emerged in 1955, leading a mass boycott in Montgomery to end legal segregation in the, in the buses, but not there. A nine-year struggle to end legal apartheid in all public facilities. It was not common and on the day he gave the speech to so widely reported in Washington, I have a dream speech. Yes. It was two parts of that speech you must know. One is that from Texas across to Florida up to Maryland, blacks couldn't use a single public toilet. Mm -hmm. We could not sit on the lawns of our capitals. Mm -hmm. uh, black soldiers didn't have the same rights as Nazi prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. It was a horrible time, kind of state-sponsored terrorism in the south of our, of our country. And so against that backdrop, he said, you promised President Lincoln Emancipation Proclamation a uh, hundred years ago. The Congress, you promised freedom to the 13th Amendment. And so I dream of a day mm -hmm. when you will honor the promise that you made a hundred years ago. And so there was that inspiring moment that, that thrust that movement forward to break down <clears throat> ancient legal, cultural, racial, gender barriers. Mm -hmm. And so that movement to tear down walls and build bridges has not stopped. And one result of it is to have an African-American governor from the housing, the poor area of Chicago who's now governor of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. to have an African-American who is now the governor of New York, who is legally mm -hmm. blind, who mm -hmm. came out of our civil rights movement. He was a uh, delegate in 1988. To have an African-American president, to have a woman Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. have a woman Secretary of State, one mm -hmm. sees these struggles to break down legal, racial, gender, religious barriers that we might be free to make real choices. Yeah. We see a certain maturing mm -hmm. of the American public. And I, I call it maturity because to the, to the, the indecency mm -hmm. 
Denying someone a place on the bus because their race was just immature. Denying people the right to vote to pay taxes was just indecent and immature. But now one sees America maturing and coming closer to its destiny of being a nation of many people, though many people we are working hard to become one. We have to go for another short commercial break, but don't go away because we still have Reverend Jesse Jackson after this. You are still watching Tamu Awani and I am still here with Reverend Jesse Jackson. Was the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was where you first really mature into fighting in the systematic way against not, all these organizations? Not really. You know, uh, I, was, I, brought, I was brought up in legal segregation, apartheid in mm -hmm. South Carolina, mm -hmm. which is very much like South Africa. In fact, South Africa learned much of its apartheid schemes from South Carolina. Yeah the state where the first shot was fired to, for the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So very, very, lots of pain growing up in that situation. But July of 1906, I was arrested with a group of classmates trying to use a public library. Yeah. And we were in the NAACP Youth Conference at that time. Mm -hmm. the NAACP got us out. Mm -hmm. When I went to school in North Carolina, I was working with CORE, the Congression, Congress of Racial Equality. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I began to work with Dr. King in 1965, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So I had been involved from my teenage years. And of course, meeting Dr. King, of course, took everything to another level because yeah. he was so, mm -hmm. so profound mm -hmm. and so courageous and so wise. So to be around him was, to, was a great privilege and an inspiring intellectual and physical journey. When you heard the show, you were there, right? Yeah. At the same place. Can you bring us back to that moment? Because maybe the younger viewers here, they, they only know about it by reading about it. But can you bring us through that moment, what you actually felt at that particular time? You know, Dr. King lived a, a very risky life because he was the change agent. And when he led the boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, his home was bombed. Later, he was stabbed. And as we brought down those racial barriers in public facilities, he became accepted by 1964. Mm -hmm. He challenged the Vietnam War. He said the U.S. was wrong to be involved in the Vietnam War. It was, it's, it's, it was not a role. It was not winnable. It was not right. It was taking resources from war on poverty at home to the war in Vietnam. That was a, a war that had no, in his judgment, no moral foundation. That angered the military industrial complex. It, it angered the American political structure. It angered those who always held him in a disdainful way in the first place. And so the press began to attack him and isolate him because of his position against the Vietnam War. And, and we were preparing to go to Washington to march and engage in civil disobedience, sit in, go to jail, mm -hmm. demanding two things, end the war in Vietnam and end poverty at home, mm -hmm. reinvest in America. That was the basic thrust. Mm -hmm. And on the way to that journey, we were asked by a friend to stop by Memphis, mm -hmm. where garbage workers were marching, trying to get recognized in their union to get decent wages. It was in that setting that uh, the ultimate tragedy occurred. And we'd been together there for over maybe about three days. And I was coming across the courtyard. We'd been in the room all day that day talking and really laughing and reflecting. The night after he'd given the I've been at the mountaintop speech, which in reflection seems a speech that was so full of predestination and pain and prophecies that I've been at the mountaintop, uh, I've seen the promised land. Yes. We as a people may not get there. Mm -hmm. I, I may not get there, but we as a people will get to the promised land. All that was in that speech the night before. So the next day we sat in the room and we were laughing, reflecting uh, casually. We were scheduled to go to dinner at night around 6 o'clock to mm -hmm. Reverend Billy Kyle's home to dinner. And I was coming across the courtyard. He was coming out of his door laughing. He said, Jesse, we're going out to dinner. You don't even have on a tie. I said, but Doc, 
the prerequisite of eating is an appetite, not a tie. He laughed. He said, you're crazy. We laughed. And so he bent over and was talking to a friend of ours who was sitting in a car below and said, please play my song, my favorite song tonight, Precious Lord. Ben said, I will, Doc. And they laughed. And, and he raised up. I said, Doc. And they hit him. It was, a, it was a powerful rifle shot that severed his tie. And it was, he was killed instantly, really. It was, a, it was hard to describe that moment, even to reflect upon this. It's heavy. I got up and went and called Mrs. King. I had his telephone by his bedside mm -hmm. and said, I, I think he has been shot. I couldn't, say, I couldn't say really what I saw. It was too much to say to her. But I think you should get over here as quickly as you can. I suppose in the next five or ten minutes, the press had called and told her he had been shot. And so then we had to make a big decision. One was to not let one bullet kill a revolution. Yeah. We had to go forward with our pain and grief and not hang around Memphis. We had to go on to Washington to keep raising the issue of, of end the war the Poor People's Campaign. We never stopped. So it was a moment, of, it was a defining moment because many who hated him on April 3rd mm -hmm. idolized him on April 5th. Mm -hmm. they, they, they rejected the living hero but embraced the dead martyr, which happened so often and so happened. Yeah. And so in some sense, his April 4th, 6th, becomes a defining moment for our struggle, mm -hmm. but it inspired it inspired it to con continue. We never stopped. Should that come now through the policies, more and more of the policies of uh, President Obama? Because we in, in this side of the world, whenever we meet people like you, activists, or even social friends, we have a different view of America. When we look at its former policies, the invasion of Iraq and all this, you know, there's like a very big gap. But is he now the man? to finally say with one voice of America that this is the bridge of peace that I'm pushing out? It must be many voices mm -hmm. epitomized by the president, many voices. Oh, we have the resources. When the G20 meets mm -hmm. the big countries, or when the G2 meet U.S. and China, they cannot only speak of trade policies and banking policies. Mm -hmm. They must speak of poverty illiteracy, disease, HIV AIDS, that which threatens human beings, mm -hmm. must now speak of, of the threat of terrorism. Yeah. There, are, there are issues beyond just, I mean, so if the banks are stable, mm -hmm. there's economic growth, but poverty is growing, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if the wealthy are getting wealthier quicker uh, and the poor can hardly survive, that's not a good thing. Yeah. We want to even the playing field for the human family. You know, in Beijing, China last year, you had the Olympics, the Athletic Olympics. Mm -hmm. And what was significant about the Olympics was that uh, gold and silver medals were distributed all around the world. Mm -hmm. Swimmers from America and mm -hmm. track stars from Jamaica and all of that. And, and when it was over, there was no conflict. There was no social upheaval. Why could we accept the conclusion of the events in China? Because on the Olympic rules, the game started at zero, zero. Mm -hmm. The playing field was even for all runners and swimmers. The rules were public or transparent, and the goals were clear. Mm -hmm. So those athletic rules, and they were overseen, by the way. Mm -hmm. They did not self-regulate. They were overseen. But in, when it comes to trade and health care and education, the field is not even. The rules are not public. The goals are not clear. And you have these real disparities. These disparities between have and have not, between the surplus culture and the deficit culture, creates tensions. It, in fact, creates terrorism. It creates rebellion. It creates wars. So one way, of course, to end these wars is to make life more accessible and more affordable to more people. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Reverend. I have tons more questions to ask, but that's all the time I have. Thanks to you for watching. Thanks to the Bridges uh, Dialogue series uh, towards a culture of peace. Thanks to the International Peace Foundation. So until another episode of Tamu Awani, that's all. Good. <laughs>